Welcome everyone to my talk, Cutting Through the Fog of Virtualization. My name is Bernd Bendemir. I'm head of data science at Clockwork.io. At Clockwork, we believe that accurate, scalable, and stable clock sync is going to be a game changer in distributed computing. My role here is data science, so I extract insights and meaning from the telemetry data that our software generates. Prior to this, I was at Aruba Networks for several years where I was responsible for the AI and ML components in all of Aruba's cloud products. I have a background in network information theory with a PhD from Stanford, and I'm originally from Germany, so you may hear some German accent today, but I've lived in California since 2006. Why is the cloud so popular? So that's the promise of virtualization, the promise that your system can work at any scale depending on the load. You don't have to make an upfront investment. Your system will simply scale up and down depending on the need and you only pay what you're actually using. This is backed up by the cloud providers by some resource guarantees. So for example, every VM behaves the same, independent of location, date, time of day, and every network link between the VMs behaves the same. There's also resource isolation. That means even though there are other VMs by other customers of the cloud running alongside yours, there won't be any effect of that. Your neighbors won't bother you, and likewise, your own VMs won't affect each other performance-wise. Anyway, those are the claims that the cloud providers make. Let's look a little deeper. Let's pop open the hood of the cloud and see how that works under the hood. So let's imagine for a second we are a cloud provider. We're building up a new data center. We're going to buy some physical machines, physical hosts. We're going to arrange them in racks. We're going to connect them with switches so that they can talk to each other. And now we're ready to receive requests from our customers. Requests come in uh, for VMs to be run, and we are going to have a proprietary placement algorithm that decides which VMs run on which actual physical machine. So here's an example. There are different sizes of VMs, bigger ones and smaller ones, depending on their resource needs. And the placement algorithm has to put them on the physical hardware, and it's trying to ensure even loading across the data center. It has to do this in a dynamic fashion, meaning VMs can appear and disappear at any time as the customer system scales. So it has to maintain that balance across time as well. Now let's switch sides. If we are a customer of this cloud, let's say we want to rent three medium-sized VMs, our VMs might be placed like this. They might be on different physical hosts on the same rack, or they might be on different physical hosts on different racks where they have to talk to each other through multiple network hops or they might actually be on the same physical machine. We as customer have no control over this. And in fact, we don't even have visibility into this placement since it's a proprietary algorithm. But you can see the problem, especially this last case here where all the VMs are running on the same physical hardware. It's easy to see how this could lead to a performance bottleneck. So the rest of this talk will be about the implications of VM co-location, the fact that VMs may be on the same physical host and be impacted performance-wise. We'll study this in real-world situations. Before I go into any more detail, I just want to point out a big difference between VM co-location and shared tenancy. Shared tenancy is what everybody knows. The cloud is a shared environment, so there will be other VMs of other customers running alongside on the same hardware. The picture on the top right shows a typical situation of shared tenancy. The different colors are the different owners of the VMs, and all of these VMs will run their own workloads. The load on these VMs will be independent of each other. That means they are not related to each other. There will be load spikes on some of the VMs at certain points in time, but because the work is unrelated, the load spikes average out across the VMs. This makes it easy for the cloud vendor to manage the infrastructure and to satisfy the performance guarantees because the load spikes will be washed out by all the other VMs that don't have load spikes at the same time. In VM co-location, the situation is different. The second picture there, you see several VMs and now belong to the same owner. And so those VMs are very likely to actually participate in the same workload at the same time. The load spikes, when they happen, will now happen simultaneously and the averaging out won't help. There won't be a smoothing out of the spikes and so this can lead to the performance problems. So you can see that VM co-location is actually much worse than shared tenancy. You can think of this as a group of people walking over a bridge and they're actually walking in lockstep. So this creates a much higher mechanical load on the bridge uh, than a typical ordinary number of same people would cause. Or said another way, the same bridge 
will be able to support fewer people if those people walk in lockstep. So that's the same situation with VM co-location. So what are some of the potential effects of VM co-location? Let's just, before we look at the data, think about what we would expect to happen. It turns out that CPU and memory are actually well isolated between VMs, but networking not so much. Networking is more coupled between VMs. So what are the effects? Network metrics we care about. Bandwidth, first of all, we would assume that co-located VMs, since they have to share physical network interfaces, would have some bandwidth correlation. Their bandwidth might be impaired. Second, network latency. Since packets between VMs that are co-located don't have to traverse the actual physical network, you could assume that the latency might be lower. And packet drops the same way. Since the packets between co-located VMs don't have to traverse a physical network, you could assume that there would be fewer packet drops because there are fewer opportunities for packets to get lost along the way. So how do these effects actually play out in practice? That's what I want to show you. And to do this, we actually have realistic data that we have collected from the real world. We've run 3,000 test cluster instances on the three biggest cloud providers, Amazon, Google, and Azure. We ran these in different geographical regions. And in each cluster, we would bring up 50 virtual machines. We'd instrumented with Clockworks clock sync system to record the data for us. And we would run the Clockwork Latency Sensei audit, which basically puts the cluster through different phases of load so that we can observe all the operational properties that we care about. How do we actually determine VM co-location? I said earlier, it's propri proprietary information and it's not actually revealed by the cloud provider. It turns out that when we run the ClockSync system, we can determine the co-location as follows. The ClockSync works by exchanging tiny packets between the participating nodes, so the 50 nodes in this cluster here, and measuring the relative clock offsets and clock drifts between those nodes. When two VMs or two nodes are co-located, that means they actually have the same physical underlying clock. So by computing the corrections for these clocks, we can tell which clocks are physically the same ones and therefore which VMs are co-located. In this picture here, you see an example of a 50-node cluster where we've done this reconstruction. Each of the purple circles is a VM and each of the gray circles are the reconstructed co-location structure. There are also dashed lines here, which indicate that our algorithm is not quite sure what the co-location was, but for the purpose of this talk, you can just focus on the solid gray circles. So through the clock sync, we are actually able to reverse engineer the VM co-location and then correlate it with the performance metrics. That's what I'm going to show you next. Let's start with network bandwidth. Here's a first example. During the Latency Sensei audit, we measure the network bandwidth for the participating nodes. We do this by running something like iperf, where we send long TCP flows between the VMs. In the bar plot on the right-hand side here, you see the measurement results. Uh, this instance type here was actually nominally supposed to give 10 gigabits per second of bandwidth. And indeed, the majority of the VMs achieves that. You can see all the purple bars are very close to 10 gigabits per second. But you can also see the orange bars, which are much impaired. It turns out that the orange bars are exactly the VMs, as you can see on the left, that are co-located. In particular, there's this group of seven VMs that are all on the same physical host, and those exactly correspond to the lowest bars on the right-hand side, where the number sometimes is two and a half or even just two gigabits per second. So co-located VMs have severely lower network bandwidth. Now, this was one example. Let me show you on average across all the cluster runs we did, how this played out. Let's start with Google Cloud. On the left-hand side here, you see for the N1 standard four instance type, how co-location affects network bandwidth. For one or two VMs on the same physical host, so low level of co-location, there's no impact. So you see, you get the full 10 gigabits per second. When co-location goes three, four, five, or even six VMs on the same host, that's where you start to see a degradation of the network performance. The same picture also happens on the right-hand side in the N2 standard four, which is a more modern VM instance type. There, the effect hits a little later. So with three, you're still okay. I, I'm assuming they're using a more up-to-date network hardware. So the total bandwidth is a little higher, but starting with four, five, and six, again, you see the impairment. Next, let's look at AWS. Here again, we looked at two instance types. On the left, you see M4X large. That's actually an older instance type where the bandwidth is not even promised. So 
they don't say a number, but what you're actually getting is something like 800 megabits per second, so less than a gig. And uh, that's consistent across uh, co-location. So it's a low number, but at least you're getting the same number always. On the right-hand side, we are seeing M5X large. That is a more modern instance type, actually priced very similar to M4X large, but obviously getting much better performance. Here, we're seeing that consistently we're getting 10 gigabits per second. I should say that AWS actually has a stated policy that they try to place uh, VMs separate from each other. They try to actively avoid co-location. This is because they want to avoid correlated hardware failures. And this is also why here in the plot you never see five or six VMs on the same machine because it's actively avoided. When it happens, the impact of bandwidth is relatively low compared to Google. Thirdly, look, let's look at Azure. Here again, we have two instance types. A standard D4S v3 on the left is similar to the Amazon slower instance. We were getting two gigabits across the board as promised. On the right-hand side, we're promised 10 gigabits per second, and we're starting to see degradation when the VM co-location goes above four. Here you might lose 20 or 30% of the bandwidth when the co-location grows too much. One nice thing about Azure is that during times of low load, they actually lift the speed limit. So even though the nominal bandwidth is 10 gigabits per second, if you're lucky, you might get much higher numbers. Like in this case, you're getting up to 20 gigabits per second. So sometimes you get impaired, sometimes you get actually faster than what you're promised. Next, let's look at let network latency. We measure network latency by computing the two-way delay between any two VMs. Two-way delay is the sum of uh, two one-way delays, which excludes the effect of the turnaround time at the receiver, so the time it takes in the, in the user space to send the response packet, and it also excludes as much as possible the sender and receiver stack delays. So we measure the timestamps as low level as possible. Here's the result for AWS. In this histogram, you see that there are two colors. The orange is the non-co-located pairs of communicating nodes, and the blue is co-located. And what you see is in AWS, the latency distribution is very similar between co-located and non-co-located. This contradicts our expectation where we thought that co-located VMs would be faster to communicate with each other. This does not happen in AWS. So their virtual networking stack hides any potential latency benefits that you might expect. In Azure, the situation is actually even a little bit worse. Here we see a very counterintuitive result where the co-located VMs actually see higher latency. So the blue curve looks, looks to be centered about 150 or 200 microseconds of two-way delay, whereas the orange one is about 50. So why is that? It turns out that Azure has accelerated networking that's optimized only for the typical case. Typical case being VMs reside on different physical hosts and that is the happy path that they have optimized for. When VMs reside on the same physical host, it actually raises an exception in their stack and is not handled by the accelerated hardware, but is passed back to the software stack. And that is why co-located hosts are slower to communicate with each other. So in Azure, co-located VMs actually have higher latency. In Google, the picture looks much more varied. Depending on the instance type and the region, we may see a variety of behaviors. On the right-hand side, we have a behavior that's similar to Azure, where co-located VMs are slower. In the middle, we have a case similar to AWS, where co-located and non-co-located VMs see exactly the same latency distribution. And on the left-hand side, we see a case which we had actually expected, which is co-located VMs have lower latency. So that, that case actually does happen on Google Cloud sometimes in certain conditions. Next, let's look at packet drops. So in each measurement run that we do, we send tens of millions of probe packets. These are UDP packets and they make it lost on the way. So what we measure is what fraction of packets actually was lost, meaning was sent but never received. Here we see that the co-located VMs and non-co-located VMs have similar percentage of packet drops. So in Azure and Google, it's about 60 or 70 packets per million that never arrive. In AWS, it's a little higher. It's about 220 packets per million. But in all three cases, there's no difference between co-located and non-co-located VMs. This means that most of the packet drops actually don't happen in the network path. 
but instead happen in the hypervisor uh, that is the same between co-located and non-co-located. So most likely the drops are happening in the rate control algorithm that they use to enforce the promised speeds. Now to summarize, we've looked at three different network metrics and we found that VM co-location actually has performant impact, performance impact, negative impact, and no upside whatsoever. Contrary to expectations, we did not see any upside. We saw that highly co-located VMs have lower network bandwidth, typically, and co-location does not have a latency or a reliability slash packet drop benefit. So for optimal cloud performance, you want to avoid VM co-location. VM co-location is a wrinkle in the promise of virtualization, and it's not something that the cloud providers would happily tell you about. But if you want optimal performance for your cloud system, you should care about VM location and you should try to avoid it. Clockwork Latency Sensei actually provides this kind of visibility into your cloud system. Using our accurate clock sync measurements, we can make VM co-location visible. And uh, through the Latency Sensei audit reports, you can see how your particular cloud system, your instance is actually impacted, if at all, and how you can avoid that impact. With that, I'd like to thank you for attending and uh, you can reach me at my email address here. You can check out Clockwork at clockwork.io and I'm happy to discuss more with you in the Q&A session. Thank you for attending and special thanks to ScyllaDB for organizing this conference. <laughs>